Uh, so that's the whole game of fighting is is just controlling your emotions. You know what I mean? Is is not letting anything, not letting the environment around you get too big mm-hmm. so you start acting, performing differently than you do every day, day in and day out, day training. This is the this is the I Am Redemption podcast, and today we have a UFC fighter, Mr. Connor Matthews. I was lucky enough to meet Connor when he was in Austin for the UFC Austin event a couple weeks ago. Um, one of the most coolest, humble dudes I've met. I uh, was very very surprised by how cool and humble he was. Found out he's uh, he's also a fellow Air Force vet, and we got to chat, and he agreed to come on the podcast. So without further ado. Connor Matthews, thank you, sir, for taking the time to come on the I, I Am Redemption podcast. My pleasure, dude. Thank you so much for having me, man. Of course. Dude, where um, where does your journey even begin, man? Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> so, the beginning, I mean, so I started fighting in uh, 2000, 2011, but um, I've been I've been a lifetime martial artist. So, um, you know, me doing the UFC thing has kind of been a progression of like my life. I started when I was five years old. Uh, doing like traditional style American Kempo and I kind of did that all the way up through high school and uh, you know started fighting after high school so yeah that's basically where I started off where um were you so you're into that and then I, I, I read up on your story and everything did you look at the military as a route to get to fighting or how did that happen not at all so um basically what happened is um actually my my original plan uh, I did martial arts always on like kind of like the side for me it's always been like a, uh, just my, just a passion. You know what I mean? I, I didn't really, especially as a kid, you don't really plan on taking martial arts and going anywhere with it besides just doing martial arts. Right. So, um, that, so that's kind of, so I, my main sport is I wanted to play college hockey. I was, I played competitive, uh, hockey where I, you know, I played at prep schools. I played at, uh, junior level hockey. And that was like my niche, my original goal is to try to make it to the NHL. And then, um, my senior year playing high school hockey, I blew out my shoulder and I kind of like missed my whole opportunity, a lot of the, the tryouts and everything for that. Um, so I found myself just getting into martial arts more because, you know, I needed something else to, you know, to take up my time. And that's when uh, uh, my, actually my sensei, because it was like my traditional school, he, he was just like, hey, we're going to put you in for a fight. So I was like, all right. So I, I turned 18 as soon as I graduated and I took an MMA fight and, uh, I got the bug, man. I loved it. Like, I, that's all I wanted to do after that. It's like, you know, I, cause I was doing sparring and doing like kickboxing kind of karate style is different than the fight. You know what I mean? A fight was like a whole nother level of like adrenaline and just like commitment. And I just was really into it. So, um, instead of going to college, I spent two years after that, like working construction up in Boston in the winters and like freezing my ass off and working on roofs and stuff and just training. So, um, you know, a couple of years of that, my parents kind of like, hey, man, well, what's your plan? Like, is this what you're going to do for the rest of your life? Or like, you know, you're going to try to go back to college. And I was like, yeah, I don't really want to do any of that stuff. And that kind of led me to the military and just kind of my my mindset and attitude about how I was like very like driven. Uh, the special operations thing really kind of piqued my interest. And I, I started, uh, I talked to an Air Force recruiter. I actually originally I wanted to be a SEAL, but um, he kind of didn't give me the job I wanted. So I talked, I talked to the Air Force, and they kind of sold me on the whole combat control and air rescue thing. Um, I was already in really good shape, so uh, the first test I took, I kind of blew it out of the water comparatively to some other people, and I took somebody's slot, and I just like shipped to be a combat controller. Kind of before I even knew what the hell I was getting myself into, to be honest. Really? <laughs> you know what I mean? I got, I was just like, all right, yeah, I guess I'm gonna do this, and I just got. Along with then I you know I, I shipped that and really do too much research into what the job actually did or anything like that. Um, I I had an uncle who goes in the Air Force. So he kind of told me a little bit, but I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, to be honest. Right, dude. I did uh, I did six years in the Air Force. I was a crew chief on C one thirties, and uh, nice. I was I I joined right after nine eleven happened, literally right after, and so yeah. I went in and, you know, came down here to San Antonio to Lackland and did basic and did my training. And so I ended up getting getting sent over to uh, Germany. And yeah. I did. I was too young, man. I didn't have the life experience to know how good I had it. And so then I made the mistake of getting out of the Air Force. And I thought I missed back home. I thought I was missing 
everybody's back home doing big bad things and dude i come back and just oxycontin had leveled my area everybody's yeah. messed up everybody's in trouble and i was like oh i made a big mistake and so i started losing my way as soon as i got back there and so i knew quickly i had to get back into the military and kept trying to get back in the air force kept trying to get back in the air force and they wouldn't take any prior service at the time so eventually i decide i'm going into the army and so i go to the army and we had to do like a little refresher where we get recalled on weapons, get back into shape. And I was like halfway through it. And then I get a call from the Air Force recruiter. And he's like, hey, man, if you want to get back in, just bring me your folder. And I was like, you son of a bitch. But Jeez. but did, did my time in the Army. Proud to say I was in both. Um, yeah. But when people... So but you're going to have it worse because you saw how good it is to be in the Air Force. And then you lived in the Army life. So it's kind of like... Exactly. That's... That, and that, must have, that must have been an adjustment period, you know what I mean? That, like, the Air Force is like, you know, I mean, you can say what you want. I mean, yes, they, I mean, but it's kind of true what they say. We have it a lot easier than the Army does and all the Marines and all the other services in a lot of ways. I mean, it's, like, it's kind of a cushy, cushy lifestyle there in, in the Air Force. So, um, I mean, my job not really wasn't particularly like that, but, like, there was a lot of things that we had that were kind of like, you know, got the best gear always. We always got, you know, Good, good places to stay uh we had a good budget for like to do what how we wanted our planned our trips not you know what i mean we weren't living out and when we didn't have to we weren't living living roughing it too bad i'll tell you that right yeah the, yeah the air force takes all their money they get from the government puts it into housing and everything while the other one yep. other branches put it into weapons yep the uh crazy. the so with that with for those that don't know, a combat controller, that's the Air Force's special special operations and stuff like that. What does that look like for you deployment-wise or, like, day-to-day-wise work? So, uh, day-to-day, I mean, yes, we're special operations. So, you know, we, we, we're trained to all of our skills. We have a lot of different skill sets. I mean, we, we, we have halo jumping. We have dive. We have dive um you know tactic schools like we go to a lot of different shooting schools around the country like high level shooting schools i'd say like when it comes to like operationally and training like we're i think we're some of the best operators out there um just like we just talked about like, kind of air force has the budget to kind of give us the money and we don't have a huge community mm-hmm. so it kind of lever- is it, we're able to you know send up send our guys to a lot of good really good schools so um you know our pipeline was two and a half years uh pretty grueling pretty tra- challenging um you know, just like dive school, it was really hard. Um, our 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 co- combat control school is really pretty challenging. Our air traffic control school is pretty challenging. You said and, you said uh, you said two and a half years of training. Yeah, two and a half plus, man. For me, it was. I mean, it should be two and a half. It should be. It should be honestly two years. But when you go in between schools and between training cycles and stuff like that, and like for us, they're like when we're, we're not in training, it's probably just as hard as going through a school. They're like smoking you know, every single day and stuff. Right. But um. So yeah, it's like two and a half years. I got hurt. Uh, blew, I came back home and I wrestled and I tore all the ligaments in my knee. I halfway through the pipeline, which kind of fucked me up. And I just kind of had it. You're only allowed to wash back one one class, so I only washed back one, and I kind of had to finish the pipeline with the with the messed up knee. So that kind of sucked. But um, then um, uh, yeah, and then I then I washed back at one one other school, so it kind of pushed me back. But yeah, it's it's like a two and a half year pipeline generally for people. So it's a lot of training, man. It's a lot of training. And then you get on team and then our deployments, you know, you have to wait for 20, like a six month long deployment. So it's like, you know, it's different than the army is like where you guys have like a year long deployment and training wasn't so long. So, and now at, at this time, are you thinking this is it, this is what I'm going to do? Or like when, at what point is fighting then, you know, where, how does that transition happen? So, yeah, I mean, I, I was actually, I mean, I was all in for especially, to, you know, to make it, you kind of have to be all in. I thought that was probably what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, I, I loved it. I loved it. I loved a lot of the things about the job. Um, I did my deployment to Afghanistan and I came back and I was, you know, I wasn't saying like, I'm not like, I wasn't like jumping under tables, PTSD, but I was definitely like, you know, wasn't just the same. I had some sort of depression. Like, I don't know what it was. I was just, was feeling weird and not. Uh, just like kind of like anytime I struggle with anything in my life, I, I went back into martial arts. So, um, so after I did my deployment, um, I, I, uh, came back home. I started training literally like not to fucking be in the UFC. I just started training to deal with my issues, but I got way better waste than I ever did before my entire life training. And 
and I kind of was like, hey, they kind of speak this. And I was like, I think I have a chance to, you know, try to make it to the UFC. I, was, I kind of want to take that avenue. It's one of those passions that I had before the military that I still wanted to kind of, I've always been itching me, especially when I see my friends like making it to the UFC at home, guys that train with my whole life. I saw them doing it and I was like, dude, I was like better than those guys. And I thought, you know what I mean? Like, I, 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 I could definitely do that. And, um, and yeah, so after my, my listing came up and I decided to make this decision to, you know, get out and chase that MMA. Ever made thing, um, you know. Another day, if I would have like reenlisted, I would have stayed in for another, uh, for another like four years. So that would have brought me to halfway. So if at that point, you might as well just do your twenty. You know what I mean? That's what I was thinking. So I was like, yeah, I hopped out and chased the main dream. But you know, I still love the the community. The job was really cool. Deployment, you know, I got to see, got to do the Afghanistan. I I, I went out with an ODA team while I was out there. So you know, I got to do got to do my thing, and I just you know I decided I. I checked all the boxes i wanted to do i would want to chase the mma dream right then it's on on to the next day yeah the um the so i was just talking about this with 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 our previous guests but anybody it's it's kind of my belief you know it's it seems like anybody that takes an alternative route to employment whether you're going to go be a a comedian a podcaster a fighter a musician or something there comes that point where you have to take that leap of faith and say, I'm all in on this and it's either time yeah. to sink or swim. I can't, I don't know what it was like for you, but in the military, I was, I always thought there's no life after the military. Once you get out of the military, you are done. There's nothing. You're going to work at McDonald's or something like that. I don't know if it was like that for you. Probably not, you know, maybe not being in special operations, but what was that leap like for you? Uh, scary as fuck, man. I was definitely, that was a truly challenging part of my life is especially to chase like something like fighting, which is not too lucrative. And like, you know, I always had the dream, like, I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to try to get a job as a firefighter or something like that, you know, abusing my veteran status to get out, but like still getting out. And then there's a, there's a, there's a weight priority. It's not as easy as you, it's as you, they may seem like I tried, I've been trying to get on as a firefighter since I got out four years ago and I still didn't get on. And like, thank God other things panned out for me. You know what I mean? But like, I was still like, dude, it was a struggle getting out of it, get out of it. Never mind the pandemic just hit us. Mm. So honestly, I think the pande- pandemic kind of was good for me because everybody slowed down when I came out. So you get out, it's not like you're, you're, you just can't get a job anywhere because, you know, every, or whatever. It's like everybody else working, you're not doing anything. It was like kind of when that hit me, it's like everybody was doing nothing. So uh, that was kind of good for me, I think. And, you know, the government started giving us like those $1,000 stimulus checks or whatever it was so i was able to survive and you know i just trained every single day because we weren't allowed to do anything else anyways and um i think that helped me first into my fighting career to be honest right so so you uh what was the the organization you were in before the ufc it was called i was in quite a few uh combat zone was the most recent one i fought in before i got out um so that's what I had the Dana Weiss looking for a fight uh, thing that got me another. So I, what happens for my fighting career is I uh, I fought, um, you know, it took me four years to finally with the pandemic and all that stuff after I got out to, to you know, finally break through and try to get a sh- my first shot at the uh, Dana Weiss contender series. Um, that was in 2022. What is it? 2022? Yeah, so 2022, the summer of 2022, I had my first 5-0. and um, I was going to fight another get Francis Marshall 5-0. and and uh, we went into we had an absolute war of a fight. I, you know, I didn't end up winning that fight, but um, it was a really good fight for me. I learned a lot about myself. D- and, d- um, you know, Dana was Dana was pretty pretty impressed. I think off off of that, even though I lost, he was still like you know, those guys went out there and they fucking you know put on a show, or whatever, blah blah blah. Um, luckily, uh, after that fight, uh, Dana White came back to Boston. And he filmed the episode of Dana White's looking for a fight. It's a show that he has on YouTube. Yeah. And it's pretty big. It's like over a million views and stuff. It's a pretty big show. So um, he, he came to a, Cal, uh, a combat zone, which is a promotion up in Boston. So it was going to be the first time I fought an encore, encore casino in the city of Boston, you know, in front of my fans and everything. So uh, on, on St. Patrick's Day weekend. So that's like a big, you know, I was an Irish kid. It was a fun weekend. He came in. I fought, I fought in front of him. I, uh, you know, finished the guy pretty good. Um the guy was pretty good. He's eight and three. I finished him. And then uh, so then they invited me to come back on Dana Wise Cadet Series a second time and you know, and earn my contract. Right. And that's that's where you got your win, right? Yes, yeah, sir. That that that's what's up. The the one guy you fought, I was just curious and, and this is no absolutely no disrespect to him, but the guy you fought in your third fight was like something in ninety. What do you mean by that? His, oh, oh, 
his, like, his record, he had like. Oh yeah, yeah. You said you said no. Oh, you're talking about. Uh, you're talking about freaking uh, Jay Ellis. So yes, I'll tell you all about that. So basically, on the local scene, all right. Um, like after I got my first couple of fights, like I would schedule a fight with somebody. You know what I mean? And all then right. like the last two two weeks or three weeks somebody he would fall out or dude this happened to me like the day up uh, your fighter fall out is just not showing up or whatever or he's, somebody got hurt right. and I, I, this ca- I, there's literally one fight where i had like four or five people like back out before i was able to fight him so they had these guys that are alert, around local dudes are literally just like hey we need to like put on the show oh, okay. and this guy's gonna show up to fight you and you know it is what it is and they probably pay him pretty good to be honest right and he sucked he was like is there, and then trust me that's the worst guy for me to want to fight because you still, he's that guy has beat in UFC fighters. He's terrible. He's not good, but every once in a while, a puncher's chance, you know what I mean? Right. Somebody will get knocked out. So, like, yeah, I, I had to fight him. They called him last up last second. I had to fight him. One of my teammates who made it to the UFC I had to fight him two times. Um, there was a couple other guys. Yeah, it's like everybody, they like, really talk, they haven't fought anybody. They have a fuck. It's like, it's not that I wasn't trying to fucking fight people on my on my way up. Good people. I scheduled this. It's, literally, it's, I couldn't get good people to schedule me to fight me. And I think it's a big problem with the local scene is none of the good fighters want to fight each other. Mm-hmm. It's fucking because cause they, they don't want to risk ruining their record the for the record, yeah. UFC. It's fucking stupid because at the same time, I get it because, you know, if you're fighting for $1,000, why would I fight some savage for $1,000 and I'll fight that could literally be on TV and just do it for nothing. It doesn't help me. You know what I mean? So that's what, how that whole thing happens. And it's really annoying. But um, that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm, I'm so thrilled to fight at the higher level in, in contender series and then fighting in the UFC is because like, you get, you, you're get you fighting, you know your guy's going to show up. Yeah. You're fighting for some money now. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I mean, first, you come out in that, you come out in that fight, you can automatically tell you're a crowd favorite in that promotion. The, the announcers are talking you up and then they set his record and I was like, did I hear that right? And I was like, how does yeah. somebody accumulate that type of record in her fighting? But that makes perfect sense. Local guy, fill-in fighter and stuff like that. It, I imagine yeah. you could accumulate quite a bit of fights. It's sad. It's sad. We always say, like, you put the JLS, like, when you need to fight JLS, put the light in the sky, JLS will show up and get his tooth out. I did, that guy fought, like, every weekend. So he's probably making, like, two or three thousand dollars every single weekend from, from these fights just to lose, to go in there and lose. He's probably making some pretty good money, you know. <laughs> good for him. Stupid, but like, it's probably true, man. Right. Yeah. So, dude, you what? What's the pro? So, you get? Do you get invited to Dana White's Contender Series, or how does somebody get on there? Yeah, you got to get invited. So, um, you know, they obviously I have a manager. So when I signed with my manager Tyson Charnier, he um he he manages the uh, the New England Cartel. He's the coach of the New England Cartel. He manages Rob Fall, Calvin Cater, all those guys. So, uh, he after I signed with him. I got my contender series, my first shot in like a month. So he, you know, he, he, he knows the right people to talk to and, and uh, get your name. If you have a good record, you got a good story. You know what I mean? The, the UFC is kind of willing to talk, talk to you. So that's kind of basically how that happened. So he, he got me that my first shot. And but then, you know, after you got, you got your shot, you got to perform too. You know, right. you can't be just, so um, yeah, he's, he's, he's the one that, that hooked that up. And, um, and you know, and, and you know, I just got a lot of guys will get that contender sh- series shot and just get lo- and lose, and then they not get invited back. You know what I mean? Right. So I had to prove myself that first time. The um, dude, what is it like walking out? I mean, you walked out to the cage before, but now you're walking out there in front of Dana White. This is your opportunity to get into the UFC. What does that feel like walking out there? Uh, so that's the whole game of fighting is 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 controlling your emotions. You know what I mean? Is is not letting anything, not letting. The environment around you get too big mm-hmm. so you start acting and performing differently than you do every day and day in and day out day training that takes a kind of like a lot of mental uh like you know practice doing that i would say so but yeah the first time i was pretty nervous and i, I didn't win the fight actually and, and i was instead of feel myself that fight on uh, the second time since i think i've been there before i wrapped it out in my brain i knew exactly what to expect i was as, as calm as me and you are talking right now right. it wasn't you know what i mean i feel like i was just i was just in the moment and it was actually fun, you know. What I mean, I went out there and, and was living my dream, man. Fighting, fighting in the UFC octagon, and you know, and having a blast and fucking and performing. Right. So it it would appear, you know, maybe somebody's view from the outside could appear like, oh man, he got on there quick. He had a, he had a couple fights. He got on Dana White's Contender Series. But like you said, you've been doing this since you were five years old. So it's been it's been a long road. What does it feel like to finally get to it and be like, holy, like? Do you wake up and pinch yourself like I'm a fucking UFC fighter? 
Yeah, I think definitely do. And there's there's the uh, there's the stress of like I'm a UFC fighter, man. I gotta get fucking training every day. Is like, all right, what did, like, I'm going to fight the best of the people in the world. And I love that. I mean, this is what I wanted. I expected that, but there's a lot of definitely. Like, you treat yourself a little bit different as an athlete. Like I'm, I'm always, you know what I mean, kind of keeping the idea that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to fight at any, any time, you know, at the highest level. So I got to keep be disciplined on my and all assets my training in life, uh, which is which is awesome. It's just you know what I mean. It's it, it you you get the most out of yourself with that mentality. So um, it's been it's been it's been awesome, man. Uh, changed my life in a lot of different ways. Like I'm able to go to different events like where I met you at the at the UFC fights you know what I mean I uh just you know on all on all elements man um I the community I've kind of built around me down here in mom's base in my gym it's just kind of you know being in the UFC has, has grown my like popularity I guess I was able to get more people to come down here and train so it's it's been a it's definitely been a dream come true right. for sure I saw your uh I saw I saw you rolling on Christmas day with some of your guys the uh Bro, I, I love that. That makes me that makes me so excited. No days off. Fuck that. I don't care if it's Christmas. I'm going to the gym still. I love I love that mentality. Did you did everybody come in there or what? Yeah, I mean, we are, we're we're always like any day. I try. I mean, I'll take a rest day when I my body really needs a rest day. But like other than that, if I can get some people train, I train. I hit pass today down here with with my coach. Um, I you know I have training tonight. Uh, even with my team right now, my coach is out of town. And uh, he, just because he's out of town doesn't mean I'm not training. Yeah, you know I mean? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna like, find a place to train every single day. It's just my passion. It's fun. I love going to different gyms, trying different things out. Um, and yeah, you know, so I'm just yeah, it's it's awesome. Man. After I got out of the military, man, I, I got injured, lost my way a long time, got hooked on painkillers, ended up getting on heroin, went away to prison, lo- lost my way for a long time. And so, luckily, fitness has paved a, a road to recovery for me and has has impacted my life so more than I can really even put into words. And so she met me as quarantine's starting to happen. And so I'm frantically, now that the gyms are shutting down, frantically running around trying to get weights and stuff like that. And so I was in my apartment lifting my couch and trying to leg press it. And so then now, I, now I've started an accumulation of equipment in our garage currently. And she yells at me because it's collecting dust. And I was like, you never know when another shutdown is going to happen. And I will not be caught without weights anymore. Yeah, I think that's smart. I agree with that, dude. Because you know it could happen any day now. You get stuck, and I, I, I'm with you a hundred percent, dude. You gotta have the home gym ready to go, even if you're not using it. You gotta have it ready to go. This, this, this is this is my therapy. I need this shit daily. <laughs> dude, I, I'm telling you, like, I, I feel like the new style. Like, I want to start. Like, I watched a movie the other night on Netflix about like the end of the world. So they have like the prepper guys, yeah. and like I'm not a prepper at all. But I'm like, I'm now I'm starting to think like I can get into that right now. So I would, I, if I was at prepping, I'd have a sick MMA gym and I'd have all my food in the world, have everything. So I, I mean, I, I'm already thinking about blowing out a wall right here and just starting a whole new prepper, prepper uh, basement gym going on. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd rather have it and not need it than, than need it and not have it. Yeah, I totally agree. And then, I mean, it's always been my fantasy for a zombie apocalypse. You know what I mean? I feel like that's the real reason why I train yep. is for that. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Dude, my wife, my wife is over here dying laughing right now because the zombie apocalypse is a constant topic in our household. <laughs> and so I go, I go back and forth on who she asked me who I would keep her, my dog, and it goes back and forth, whichever one's the least of a liability. I mean, the dog's not gonna want to eat as much food, you know what I mean? Not the human food, at least. And then you could use it to sniff things out. It's good alarm system, you know what I mean? He's, he's not building a case for you right now. <laughs> she said she wasn't. I'm kidding, I'm she kidding. said she was a huge Connor Matthews fan until that. I'm just joking. No. <laughs> my girl versus my darn eyes at me right now too. So. Right. My 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 girl's used to me talking shit twenty four seven, so she gets it. <laughs> um, so, dude, do you work with you know guy? Do you work with guys coming up? Oh yeah, yeah, a lot. So I mean, right now my gym, we got uh, I got like this guy uh, Joe Poirier, who's an up and coming pro. Um, Angel Valdina is an up and coming pro. They're both like five and one or five, five and zero, oh, four and zero. Oh. I think one of them is four and zero, oh, one is five and one. So they, they they'll be definitely making the breakthrough. I think fighting a contender series this year. So um, 
yeah, we I we we, we get team practice. There. Another guy I work with, Carlos Sozoya. He fought Sean O'Malley actually. Okay. He trains down here. So I definitely have some like up and coming pros that we be we're more teammates, you know what I mean? Yeah, I train we're trained together as teammates. And then I also train at the New England Cartel. And then um I have I do run classes for like, you know, beginner level guys. And I and I feel like I have a couple guys that I that are like I started the, from the beginning to now, they're probably gonna be fighting this summer. So that's pretty cool to see too. Is, is cre- like they did a hundred percent of their training through me. So um, that's pretty cool to have as well. So I do that, um, and, and I feel like teaching, especially down here when I run my classes, it just helps me relearn and um, you know experiment and and you know teaching other people just makes you a, as a, as a huge part of that for me being a martial artist is it's relearning my craft over again. So uh, I I think that's very important to have as an aspect like i'm not really trying to make money off my my gym anymore um i have other things that you know i I, I work for the air force still um you know administer special operations pt tests and i also um you know with the fighting thing so the 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 teaching the classes is more for just me like you know wanted to do it for fun did that that was a major major turning point in my life i i had found all this therapeutic benefit for me getting into running and working out and you know what i mean i started running races started doing all this thing which that that helped transform my life but what truly gave it meaning was when i went back and started working with like other addicts alcoholics people who have you know mental health issues and stuff like that and i started using my experience to help them that's what truly transformed my life and makes it what it is and i think you just said something about it when I'm teaching people in the gym, it's helping me learn too because I'm picking up on stuff I can't see myself doing. A hundred percent. That's all. That's all it is, man. It, it's it's it, you're relearning every single time you take anything at all and you you transfer it to somebody else. You're relearning it from a different perspective in a new way, which makes you understand the concept better. So it's like you know, and, and it goes for everything. It goes from you know, actually a technique, a martial, um, teaching them a technique, or just teaching them how to like. I have a kid that I, I trained with. Um, he he had some struggles. He, he his dad went to jail. Just got locked up for for life, and uh, you know he was struggling with with dealing with that. You know what I mean? So his mom calls me. He's like, I don't know what to do. Like he's just raging, he's angry. So I was like, All right, I'm just gonna take this kid with me wherever I go. You know what I mean? So I just literally I so for the last year he's been training with me just follows me around and i feel like you know i'm just teaching him how to be a martial artist overall so it's really cool to see to watch that and again it gives me something to believe more in myself like i can't i can't have to set a standard for him you know what i mean for him i can't like cheat at all because i'm setting an example for somebody else it's not just about me it's just an example for him so it makes me work harder day in and day out right you just said something that that brought up a good question in my head for for those that may not know because i i feel like it's a pretty deep answer some people may hear the the term martial artist and they just think oh he fights but like what is a martial artist to you because it's so much more than that oh yeah it, it's it's definitely not i think fighting is a small portion of being a martial artist um it's a it's a lifestyle of, of day in a day in and day out um it deals with philosophy you know what I mean? Just just about how to live your live your life, answering questions. What's the right answer? There's so many different styles and and um, you know theories and, and ways to do things that like there's no right answer, and the right answer for me may not be the right answer for somebody else. So it's just kind of it's it's a very encompassing thing. You just, I think it's philosophy, it's the technique, the technician portion portion of it, and I think it's the um uh, the the teaching others portions. I think all three of Three of those things are huge parts about being a martial artist. Right, that, that's awesome, dude. When you're when you are in the ring, you are you are diced as a motherfucker. You're lean as hell. What is yeah? What is you? Do you do any weight training? Strengths? Yes, I do. I do. I do. Um, I strength and conditioning two days two days a week on top of my everything else I do. Um, I do have a trainer. Um, I think the mostly um, I the the way I look is is from the diet going into the fight is yeah. just you know i lean out i walk around 166 167 i fight at 145 mm. so um you know i, I have a, a nutritionist that helps me diet my way down but i mean overall training guess i just broke the ufc's uh, record for uh vo2 max and for um glycogenic whatever it is the one it's a one minute uh what's it called uh sprint yeah. on the on the on the bike on the uh echo bike whatever it is and you know and whatever your wattage is I, I had that broke the record for that one as well 
So it's like, well, I, I was number one in 45 division for uh, VO2 max and then one number one overall for the uh, the one minute sprint test in the UFC. So I think, you know, I think the conditioning thing came from a couple of different parts. It comes from my special operations background of mentally, you know, putting myself like dive school and all these physical challenges that we, you know, the pipeline is. Um, it kind of put a tra- trained my mindset to be different and it helped and it, I can apply that into being a professional athlete and it just kind of made me who I am. You know what I mean? I be able to set records and stuff like that. Dude, when I when I was at the the height of my running career, I did the the VO two max test and all that. Mine was not a minute on the bike though. Mine was the the treadmill and it felt like it took for so you go you go up yeah we did that one as well so it's you go a minute yeah you go up every minute you go up uh wattage or whatever it is or rpms or wattage by how and you see how high you can hold what your threshold can be you can hold yeah i did that one as well the the coolest that that sucked dude the mask on can't yeah. breathe but yeah the coolest thing i learned and saw about that you know obviously vo2 max and all that was the the charts on the side that showed you for when you're using fat as fuel and then transferring over into using glycogen as fuel and it like yeah it even as an avid runner and ultra runner that i was like i didn't understand yet that there's a difference between fat burning cardio heart cardio and yeah and stuff like that and so that's one one of my favorite things to teach people when they start getting into it 100 percent, yeah man and that that glycogenic power stuff sucks to do the training for that stuff <laughs> you start that's when you start being woozy after you feel like you want to throw up and stuff is when you, when you do those hard glycogenic type style cardio workouts they're awful did you do those at the the pi yeah i did those testing at the pi yeah dude how crazy is it to walk around the performance institute oh i love it dude it's like disney world for me um you know just because first of all it has the spa thing they have where they have the ice baths, sauna, um, hot tub, that whole area. Locker rooms are sweet. You have uh, uh, beautiful jiu-jitsu rings and training upstairs. Downstairs, you have the gym, which is uh, awesome. You have PTs. So you can get lunch. Um, they feed you food. They have like your supplements there. Smooth. It's just everything you could possibly want as an athlete uh, is right there. Um, never mind all the testing they did on me. Um, it's just, it was awesome. Then you have like, you know, Forrest Griffin walking around all the, all the top UFC fighters that, you know, all these guys have been following my life are just like walking around talking to you. It's not like Volkanovski. It's not everybody. It's insane. How does, do you like sign up for a slot to go there? Can you go there anytime you want? Can you be there all the time? I can go there whenever I want. I'll, I, when you're, when you're assigned UFC fighter, um, you get allowed to bring two people with you when you go. And, um, yeah, you just got to let them know. Yeah. If you, I mean, for, if you, if I didn't have such a good team up here in New England and, you know, with Tyson and the, and the New England cartel, I mean, it's, it's, it would be awesome to live there in Vegas because like you just, the facilities you have, you have all, everything's at every, so much money's worth of shit at your disposal at any time you want to use it. It's just, just ridiculous. So, um, but you know, there's also, you know, the cost of living. I got my job up here in New England and all that part of it. So. Right. Dude, yeah, I can't imagine to walk around a, a state of the art. And there's multiple PIs in other countries. They're starting to. I, I think they're just the building one in uh, Me- New Me- uh, Mexico and Mexico City. Uh, they have one in China, I believe. And then I think they have one other one getting built somewhere else. But yeah, they're they're, they're starting to spread and put them all over the uh, put them all over the world. I hope they put one here on the East Coast, like maybe in, in like. Boston or New York or you know or Austin would be cool. Oh, they put another one. You uh, and uh, how do you uh, dude? I'm I'm from up north. I'm from Young Youngstown, Ohio, about 45 oh, minutes nice. away from Pittsburgh. So, I'm I love the cold weather. I love to come visit it. And then I yeah. like, right, you let me get my ass back to Texas. What is uh, what is it? What is the weather up there like now in Boston? So right now it's like 40 degrees outside and rainy and wet. Um, so it's you know just shitty, but uh, and it's like it's, that. It's like that ten months out of the year up there. Yeah, it feels like it feels like that at least. I mean, the summers are so beautiful. I think right. the summers up here. Uh, the only thing, my only, I I think it's good for the aspect of it keeps me in the gym. I don't want to be out doing anything. There's like uh, there's nothing to do. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of like I'm what am I gonna do? I'm just gonna stay here, stay in the gym. I like the ice. I like it when it's cold outside because I don't do my ice baths. I don't have to worry about how to figure it out. Oh, you know, hang it up. A nice bath day. I just literally just leave water outside, wake up in the morning, break the ice, and just hop in and, and, and do my ice bath every morning. So I do like for that. 
Um, the only thing I don't like, I would say like the shortness of the days. So it seems like the days go by like, you know, like a couple hours. I feel like you like the sun comes sun comes up at like nine o'clock and goes down at three. It's kinda annoying. Right. But um <laughs> can't take your vitamin D for sure up here. But um the summers are nice. I do like that. I think you could say though, like New England guys, we have like a history of tough fighters are from New England, man. Mm-hmm. It's or or the cold, man. I think that like Russians, like yeah, I think yeah. it feels a very kind of toughness. So No, I believe I believe that for sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm just getting old, man. I'm getting old naked. <laughs> the uh, are you a are you a Patriots fan? I I am. I was a Patriots fan growing up. Yes, with the uh, with the Tom Brady era, like that was me growing up in high school and shit. I fucking you know that was awesome. But yeah, I would say so. But I'm not like a diehard sports fan in general. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Fighter. That's it. Period. I would say I uh, hockey. I admire. I like, I like hockey actually because that was like my original sport. So I, I, I tune in. I feel like I know every hockey player, even though I don't play somehow. I don't even know. I just like it just gets downloaded into my brain. I just already know it. But um, I like hockey, and I like extreme sports actually. I really like like snowboarding, mm-hmm. surfing, skateboarding. Those are like my sports. I just don't do them as much because like I'm not trying to like break my fucking like. I got going snowboarding next week and i'm like scared because i just don't want to like you know what i mean do some stupid get hurt especially with my friends they fucking bomb through the woods like maniacs and still need to be getting hurt <laughs> yeah it's not the move the uh damn i keep wanting to say something about the cold and i forgot the um anyways you you got a you got a fight coming up not yet we're trying to uh we're trying to get we're trying to figure out to get one scheduled i think i i i have my teammates fighting on ufc 300 um calvin cater i saw that so so that would be cool but just trying to hop on that but he's like pretty early on the card like mm-hmm. i think he might be like a prelim and the, he was the main event anywhere else it's getting him against aljo yeah so it's like uh, so it's like you know what i mean i don't know if they would have a guy you know new guy like me on that i know the sean o'malley card looks huge that'd be cool to fight down in miami i wouldn't be surprised though there's another card going to atlantic city if something happens and i hop i end up on that one because you know, it's Atlantic City is not that far for me, so that could happen. But I'm right now. I'm just getting myself back to the fight shape. Um, I feel good. I feel great. Um, uh, healthy. Um, just waiting. You know, waiting for that call. Kind of hungry. I want to get through the holidays and just you know, I want to get back. I want to get in there again. Though I'm starting to get that itch. I'm starting to get the dreams and stuff. Like I'm not making weight. You know what I mean? Like that. My my brain's definitely like switched on for getting ready for a fight. Right. The uh. So are you gonna be at UFC 300? Um, I probably will. Uh, there's a good chance I'm going to be out there for that. Um, you going out there? I'm, we're we're trying. That's, yeah, th- that's the plan. Um, but if Calvin's fighting, I think there's a good chance that I'm going. Um, uh, but we'll see. Right. We'll see what it looks like. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go out there, spend a million dollars on 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 going to the fights or anything like that because it's going to be expensive as hell. Yeah, to get out there. right. The UFC Austin was my first one. I mean, I watch on TV all the time, but that was the first live one, I bet. And now, yeah. bro, it's I'm a big sports fan all around, but that is hands down the best live sporting event I've ever been to in my entire life. That card, oh, yeah, the card fun. was a banger. Every fight was a banger. You're close to the action. It was, it was top to bottom the best thing I've ever been to. I really like that stadium. That stadium's a good size. Yeah. I really like it. It's, it's a nice stadium. That was fun, man. That was, that was a good. That was a good spot. Is there? Are they all? Are they all pretty different? Yeah, most- I think, um, I mean, the only, only two fights I've really been to for UFC are UFC Boston and, and, and that one I just went there. So that's the only two UFC events that I've actually ever been to. I've been to UFC Boston twice and I've been to that one once. Is this, so, um, is Boston at the know, Garden both times? Yeah, that's the TD Garden. And I was, that was sick, man. And obviously I love the Garden. It's all, and it's like, but it's like, that's my, that's my dream. I want to, I want to fight there really bad. I hope, I mean, that's, that's my goal is to get a fight at the Garden. Would be awesome, dude. You're gonna get it. You're gonna get it for sure. I hope so, dude. I I got a quick I got a quick funny story for you. So, my my wife and I we've been uh we've been married for about a year. Been together for four, and ever since she uh ever since we've been together, she always you know she knows I'm in the gym every day, and she always says, "I wish somebody would come up and hit on me, or buy try to buy me a drink in front of you one time." And I was like, "Why?" <laughs> and she goes, "Well, I just want to see you impose your will on somebody." And I was like, well, that there's not a lot. It doesn't it doesn't happen quite a bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, so we're sitting there, and I was over talking to you, and my wife was sitting at the table. And so I come back, and 
<clears throat> Eric Anders is standing behind her. And so I started chatting up Eric Anders. I'm talking to him a little bit. And then I walk around and I see her and she's got this smile on her face ear to ear. And I was like, what's up? What, what happened? And she's like, oh, nothing. Are you mad I'm telling the story? She goes, oh, nothing. And so she keeps smiling. She keeps smiling. And I was like, tell me what happened. What are you talking about? She goes, it finally happened. And I was like, what? And so <laughs> apparently somebody from from Eric's team or the camp or whatever came over and said something to her. He wasn't disrespectful or anything like that. And so she's got this big smile on the face. And I was like, well, I, I hate to disappoint you, but today will not be the day where you're going to watch me try to impose my will on a, <laughs> a trained killer, let alone a team of trained killers. That's not going to happen. But that's that's just my luck. That's just my luck that it would happen there at that time. At a UFC event, yeah, with all those killers. That's hilarious. That's so funny. Bunch of guys yeah. walking around with cauliflower ears, and then now she wants to smile and be all. <laughs> but I don't know. They'll be the guys to do it, too. Right. <laughs> Dude, so if you, had to, if you had to pick one song, you're walking out for the title. What is your fight song? What's that one song that just gets you going more than anything else? Uh, I put it all in for my city. All okay. that. So Jimmy, I'm so busted up. Jimmy, are you are you a rap guy or no? I like everything, man. I I walk out. I like EDM. I like rap. I like country music, man. I don't really don't have anything, you know, specific that I like. So would you listen? Would, whatever mood I'm in. Would you listen to on the way to the gym this morning? Well, I walked downstairs. So oh, I don't okay. listen to it, but right now I got rap on right now. All right, who we bumping? Yeah. Who we bumping? Uh, we we have um, Logic. Okay. And, and Jonah Jonah Lucas, whatever his name is. Jonah Lucas. All right, cool. Yeah, Jonah, yeah. All right, we got yeah. some lyricists in there. Good shit. Yeah. What is what is so when you're not fighting? Obviously, you're fighting and you're training every day and stuff. What do you do to unwind? What is your what is fun and rest and relaxation for you? So uh, fun relaxation. I do. I really like like it sounds silly, but like recovery shit. Like I, I really like ice baths. I like getting in saunas. I like all that stuff. Obviously, because I think I'm just sore all the time. And there's like the best things that make me feel calm. Like you know, feel good. Um, but like you know, if I'm going out, man. I, yeah, I mean, I just, just I like skateboarding. I like taking the longboard out, cruising with my dog. Um, he's getting old, but he used to like hold me around on my skateboard a lot. Right. I used to love ripping around on that. Uh, I got my girlfriend hanging out there. Um, quite a bit and snowboarding man um, I love snowboarding as well or surfing I haven't been doing too much surfing this last year there's a lot of great white sharks up here in New England now which just kind of freaked me out really is that all? <laughs> yeah we it's it's been weird the last like probably three or four years we've had like a huge uptick in like great white sharks and they're like starting you know like if you watch Shark Week and they're like breaching mm -hmm. and you know they, they, they used to only do that in South Africa that's like the only place they, they did it now they're doing that shit here oh, yeah. so it's like yeah, it's crazy. Oh, uh, it's something to do with uh the the uh, seals up in like Canada and all that. They like, started coming down a lot more, so now like there's been a huge uptick, uptick in great white sharks. So I don't surf as much. Kind of sketchy out there. I had I'm 41 year I'm 41 years old, and I had no idea that people surfed in Boston. Oh yeah, we, I mean I live so I live close to Rhode Island on the South Shore, South Shore of Massachusetts, and we have a lot we have a lot of surfing up here, man. It's uh anyway, it's, it's the Atlantic Ocean. You know what I mean? So uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't think my thing growing up. Yeah, I don't know why I would have would have thought that. I just never would would associate. Cool, but I don't really give when you really surf. You don't really give a shit. You got wetsuits and stuff like that. It doesn't really matter. And the the water out here actually stays a lot warmer than it does on the west coast because we the west coast the water shoots down from like um, Alaska and all that. Our water shoots up from the south in the Gulf Stream and it comes from the south. So our water stays pretty warm into the year all the way into like November. And, but uh, yeah, obviously in December, you know, when you get to December, January, February, March, water sucks and it's cold. But, you know, it's where it was, it's not too bad. Gotcha. I got a couple more. They're just fun questions just to help the uh, the audience get to know you a little bit better. If you don't mind, you've told us your story. I can't thank you enough. The uh, I'm glad you did. What would you say is your favorite movie of all time? Um, always the movie that comes to my head is Miracle uh, for uh, the hockey movie. Yeah. I was a hockey player growing up and that's kind of like, you know, I always like, I like them. It was a very motivational movie and I've kind of believed in it my whole life. Just like that mentality they had. So that was one of the movies that stuck with me the most, I would say. That has the biggest impact on my life is Miracle. Right. You're very good movie. What about yeah. uh favorite show? Uh, Eastbound and Down. 
Ooh, good one. Very good one. Kenny Powers, the little Kenny Powers, man. He's fucking hilarious. Mm-hmm. It's just, and it's just like, it's just so funny. Mm-hmm. And I feel like every fighter is like their own version of East Mount, of Kenny Powner, Powers to yourself. You know what I mean? Like, especially like a local fighter, if you're like, like Jay Ellis, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, he probably lives up in his real, in his normal life, he probably lives off this thing. Like, he beat a UFC fighter and he, in his own. <laughs> That's how I've always imagined it. Right. Everybody's, everybody's Kenny Powers. Did my my favorite my favorite uh clip from that is the outtake when they're standing in the car dealership and it's Kenny Powers and the uh the black gentleman from Hot Tub Time Machine and oh, yeah, yeah. Will Ferrell's standing there right in the middle and he's telling the they're they're saying about let let the kids watch and all that. Yeah, let the kids watch. Let let them watch. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my favorite. That's a very good one. Dude, there's so many good one liners from that from that show that like, if you like watch it back, you yeah. like People like it became like a part of natural everybody's conversations. Just saying one of the one liners. People forget where those. They all come from Kenny Powers. I swear to God. Is there is there a lot like that? Yeah, there is. I, like you know that one one is like I'm not trying to be the best at exercising. Right. <laughs> he's like I think like, I run marathons. I do triathlons. He's like you know what I'm talking about being an athlete. He's like actually I don't know. He's like, he's like I I'm not trying to be the best at exercising. I love that. <laughs> right. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to go back and watch it. Who are who are your 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 inspirations as far as fighting goes now or when you were growing up? Who were the people you emulated, or borrowed from, um, or or just plain out looked up to? Um, so I would say uh, my, you know, looked up to um, probably George St. Pierre, GSB. I always loved him. I love him. he's he's like a complete athlete. How he like you know was really serious in different aspects of the game and just like took it really serious. Um, like you know, like he would do like. His training, he would like do gymnastics to get right. better and get more athletic. I like, I really like that, like whole his whole mentality. I like Tim a lot. Um, I love, uh, I love Max Holloway. Is like one of my favorite fighters to watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's really good. My teammates, you know, I got Robin Calvin. I think those are big inspirations to me, is just because I get to see the highlight like, what they do day in and day out. And um, I, I guess uh, Joe Lozon, he's a local MMA fighter where I grew up in, uh, around here at his gym. So I started going to his gym. He's like the first uh, kind of introduction to UFC fighters that you know ever has. So he's probably a big influence in my life too. What have you had the opportunity to uh, meet GSP or Holloway or any any of these guys? I've not met Holloway. I met GSP twice. So um, I met GSP the first time after my fight in Boston, um, where that one I won and I got my UFC uh, contract again, and I was fighting at home. Uh, so that was really cool. I met him. I met him there, and then the second time, uh, second time I met him, it was just when I was in uh, Las Vegas, like last week, two weeks ago. Um, I was doing my test for my that glycogenic test, whatever it is. So it was kind of cool. He was right there. He was like watching me while I was, I was taking doing the test. And I, I got to meet him there. So that was pretty cool. Dude, what is it? What is it like to meet him? Very cool. He's awesome. So like he was just just teaching. Like somebody else wanted to ask him a question. He was teaching his double leg. So I was like talking, he's just like, you know, right away, went right into like teaching us a technique. So that was really, really cool. He's just like super nice, super humble, you know what I mean? Exactly what you think. Uh, it's for me, he didn't, I thought he was going to be bigger. Uh, and I was like, dude, he used to fight at like middleweight and he's and he's bigger guy. He fought up like, big weight classes and stuff. So I was like, damn, I, I didn't know. Like, I thought he was going to be bigger than that. He's not that big. So, but he was really cool. Really nice. What's, what's his, what's his height weight you think right now? I bet she was 5'10". 175 pounds like really? just without right yeah so that's what he seemed like to me i think he does like he's he's, he's, he's he does uh he diets differently now also back then i don't know like he's back in the ufc when there was a lot of a lot of supplements going on right right right, right. yeah you know well, I, mean? so, I, I don't i'm not saying gsd would be the kind of guy to do steroids but like I don't oh, know, I what um what's going on so you so obviously, I, I see the rumors GSP might be fighting Nick Diaz at three hundred and all that. You didn't see that? I, I I heard that I believe a while ago, but I haven't seen it recently. Yeah, I did hear that like they wanted to do that, but that that's awesome. So I mean, I heard that, and where was I going to go with this? Oh, and then I, then I saw a video. Of Chael Sonnen was it like, he goes, "What what everybody's forgetting? Let's talk about this. Is none of these people you're talking about coming back to UFC three hundred? Him, Nate Diaz, any of these guys, none of them are in the USADA pool right now, so that's not going to happen. What's yes. going What's going on now that the UFC is not doing what you saw? It does that still take place for a couple months or six months or what? It might be a loophole to be honest, but um, the the right now I think on the first 
you saw it as all done. Okay. So, uh, so now we have a new company taking over. I think you saw like athlete something. I don't know. Sure. But, um, they, they do, they, I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure they do the, the drug testing for the MLB and for the, uh, NBA and a couple other big ones or the NFL. So, um, they're, they're the ones that are going to take over for us. So I'm interested to see what it's going to be about too. I don't know. I don't know if like guys are going to, you know I mean? Like I have no idea what it looks like. I think it's going to be, they, they say it's going to be the exact same stuff as USADA. And, and, um, I, I kind of like the whole idea about USADA because, you know, if I'm not taking anything, I don't want anybody else right. to take it. And yeah, it really for sure. me off, to be honest, that they wake come in the morning. Like, it just didn't bother me. Like, it just, uh, some people get all butthurt about that shit. I was like, dude, I, if I want to do this sport, I, 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 if I'm not taking steroids, I don't want anybody else to take fucking steroids. You know what I mean? But, um, I guess it's going to change and I, we'll see how that, I just feel like, Looking at the MLB and the NFL, like I think some of those guys are on steroids. So I don't know if that's just gonna be the same as it's going on right now, dude. <laughs> I, I had a I had a talk with somebody not long ago and they were sitting there trying to they wanted to argue me back and forth about they didn't think like professional athletes were on steroids. They're like, No, they get tested and I was like, You do understand that there's millions of dollars at stake. There's people yeah. that take steroids that aren't even getting paid for their sport that they're playing. You don't think they're gonna be taking with a million dollars millions of dollars on the line, but Dude, that that was good injuries and shit, dude. You play it that loudly, you play it that people get hurt, and then you need to get back in the game. Yeah, like, that's how it happens, dude. And then they get addicted to it. You know what I mean? Yep. It's not big. Uh, I hope not. I hope tough. not. We'll see. <laughs> Man, you know, you know, you're doing right, so that's all that matters. Yeah, dude. I can't thank you enough for coming on, man, and, and sharing about your journey, inspiration, dude. I know it's been a huge inspiration, inspiration to me. The way we like to close up the podcast is it's called the I Am Redemption podcast. And so when I say I am redemption, you know, I was able to find redemption in my story. And what what I try to get people to understand is everybody has this different different life experiences. People have been through stuff that I haven't or you haven't. You've been through stuff that I haven't and all that. And so just getting people to understand that everybody does have the ability to go out and help somebody with their story if they've been lucky enough to make it through it. So if you would be willing, man, I'd, I'd love it if you, you could throw out some I am statements to let them let the, the audience know who Connor Matthews is. So, um, so I am statement yeah. for who I am at the party. Yeah, you just be, yeah. I, I am a fighter, I am I strong, am. Uh, I'm smart, loved, whatever. Okay, uh, I'm a fighter, I'm a warrior, I'm a leader, um, I'm a teacher, and um, I am who I am. I, I, I'm the controller. There you go. <laughs> And s- <laughs> sir you are a badass man i can't thank you enough for taking the time dude it's a pleasure trust when you do fight i will be watching we will all be watching we're big Con- uh big connor matthews fans dude and I-, I just appreciate you very much sir thank you i appreciate it, man thank you so much for having me on that was a good time all right